Okay, it is time to get started. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, Paul Davies. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this year's Beyond Annual Lecture. Each year, the Beyond Center puts on a big public event in which we invite scientists to outline a provocative or visionary perspective of their field of research. This year's lecture is being co-hosted by the Arizona Cancer Evolution Center. Our lecturer, Sir Paul Nurse, is a world famous geneticist, currently director of the Francis Crick Institute in London. He served as president of the Royal Society, chief executive of Cancer Research UK, and was a former president of Rockefeller University. He is the recipient of many awards, including the 2001 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. He's also the author of an excellent new book, What is Life, which is the title of today's lecture. Paul will talk for about 45 minutes, during which time you can submit questions via the Q&A channel. And then following a brief question period, we're going to have a 40 minute discussion on some of the issues raised in the lecture by a panel of distinguished ASU faculty. So ladies and gentlemen, I now call upon Sir Paul Nurse to deliver the 2021 Beyond Annual Lecture. Paul, over to you. Well, thank you, Paul, for that nice introduction. And good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. What I'm going uh, to do this afternoon is talk about one of the fundamental uh, questions in biology. Some would say the most fundamental question. What is life? It's a very easy question to ask, uh, but frankly, not an easy question to answer. Look around you. There's an extraordinary diversity of life on our planet. All around us are bacteria, fungi, plants, animals, including, of course, ourselves, human beings. These all maintain themselves, they grow, they self-organize, they reproduce. But what is it? that links all these different life forms together. And that's what I want to discuss with you this afternoon. I think it was a butterfly that first started me thinking seriously about questions like this. It was early spring. I was perhaps 12 or 13 years old, sitting in the garden when a quivering yellow butterfly flew over the fence. It turned, hovered, and briefly settled. Then a shadow disturbed it. It took flight again and disappeared over the opposite fence. That intricate, perfectly formed brimstone yellow butterfly that you can see here made me think. It was both utterly different to me and yet somehow strangely familiar too. Like me, it was so obviously alive. It could move, it could sense, it could respond. It seemed so full of purpose. I found myself wondering, what does it really mean to be alive? In short, what is life? Now, I'm not the first to ask this question. It's been around for years. Um, for example, this is the title book of a book also called What is Life, written in 1944 by the famous physicist Erwin Schrodinger. His book was very influential, including for me when I first read it now around 50 years ago. My approach to the same question that Schrodinger asked is rather different to what he um, discussed. I want to consider five important ideas of biology. I want to describe where they came from, explain what they are, and then I want to pull them together to develop certain principles that I think are fundamental to life. And the first of these five ideas is the concept of the cell. The cell is the basic structural and functional unit of life. It truly is life's atom. They were discovered a long time ago. Cells were first seen by Robert Hooke in 1665. This is his microscope here, and he used a razor to cut slivers of cork. 
and examined them under uh, this uh, an early microscope looking like this. And what he saw were neat arrays of boxes. And you can see the picture of them in black and white on the left there. And these neat arrays of boxes he called cells after the Latin word cella for small cubicle. And this picture that I uh, mentioned to you uh, it is from a book he published a year or so later called Micrographia. On the right there, I've got a scanning electron microscope picture of also showing plant cells. Now, a few years later, but still in the 17th century, the Dutch draper, Antony von Lohenhoek, working in Delft, scraped between his teeth and discovered single-celled life, bacteria. And here you can see a picture, a drawing that he made and sent to the Royal Society in London, only founded five years before. And it's a picture of the bacteria he saw with the charming image, uh, you can see it in Fig B here, uh, to C to D, of a bacterium undergoing a, a, loop to, a, a loop the loop under the microscope. To be quite honest, he was rather disturbed by the discovery of these bacteria between his teeth because he was very proud of his dental hygiene. It didn't seem quite right to have something living between his teeth. Something else that was interesting about him was that he was a close neighbor in Delft to the painter Vermeer. And Vermeer um, painted two pictures of a scientist, not usual for that time. Here's one of them, it's in the Louvre. And I like to imagine that this somehow might be based on Lohenhoek himself. But I have to admit to you, there is not a single scrap of evidence for this speculation. Although when Vermeer died, Lohenhoek was in fact the ex executor of his will. So maybe they did know each other. Now, over the next two centuries, it became clear that all living organisms consist either of a single cell, like that bacterium, or a collection of cells. And this conclusion was summarized by the German zoologist Theodor Schwann, who in 1839 wrote, of course in German, this is a translation, he wrote, all organisms are composed of essentially like parts, namely of cells. Now, as well as cells being the basic structural unit of life, as Schwann was saying here, they are also the basic functional unit of life. This was well expressed a few years later by another German, the German pathologist Rudolf Virchow, who in 1858 um, wrote that the cell is a vital unit bearing the complete characteristics of life. He also said, all cells come from cells, in Latin, omnis cellula a cellula. This means that cells arise through the division of pre-existing cells. Two really important concepts, that a cell is the basic uh, physiological unit, vital unit of life, and all cells arise from pre-existing cells. So I think cells are really interesting. In fact, I think they need to be considered a little bit more um, thoroughly in the public arena of science. But if I fail to convince you that they are interesting, let me just show you a picture of a sperm and an egg here. It's a mammalian egg and sperm. And remind you, every one of you were once a single cell just like this. And if you're still not interested, it's probably best to turn your zoom off exactly now. Now, cells are considered to be the simplest entities which unambiguously exhibit the characteristics of life. And this means understanding cells is key to understanding life. So they're going to figure quite prominently in what I have to say. Now, cells are bounded physical entities. They're separated from their environment, surrounded by a semi-permeable lipid, that's fatty membrane, which separates them from their surroundings, but allows communication with those surroundings. Now, this separation allows order to be built up inside the cells at the expense of increasing disorder outside cells. 
And in this way, life does not contravene the second law of thermodynamics, which states that the universe as a whole moves towards disorder. This is often noted by physicists thinking about life. Like Schrodinger, who I just introduced you to, as seen in this quote from um, his book. He was astonished that life could escape the decay into atomic chaos, especially from one generation to the next. And it led him to propose that life had a code script, a code script that was somehow inherited and through the chromosomes he proposed um, from one generation of cells to the next generation of cells and through that from one organism to successive generations of organisms. Now these quotes introduce a second idea I want to share with you this afternoon. And this uh, second idea is the gene exploring the phenomenon of inheritance. Now, the idea of the gene as the basis of heredity had its origins with the work of the Augustinian monk, Grigor Mendel, abbot of Bruno Monastery, um, when he did experiments, which I'll briefly describe to you um, in the 1860s. This is Grigor Mendel, the monk, and he tackled the problem in, of inheritance by carrying out uh, crosses of pea plants. Pea plants that had rather different characteristics, easily recognized. And he then analyzed the outcomes um, of the progeny formed in these crosses and actually counted many, um, many, many such offspring into the thousands. I found this picture of his garden um, when I first visited his monastery in 1981 um, right in the middle of the Cold War, looking a bit sad for itself. It's much nicer looking now. It's been spruced up, but really iconic for me when I visited it. So Mendel crossed peas of varied characteristics, including plants of different heights, different flower colours, different seed shapes. Here's some of the examples of those sorts of characteristics. And he famously observed simple ratios in these characteristics in the progeny produced by these crosses. Ratios like three to one, which I'm sure many of you have read about in school. This eventually led to what we now call Mendelism. It took another 30, 40 years to get this completely straight. But this is that the idea is of Mendelism is that heredity is based on indivisible particles or factors inherited through the germ cells, the pollen, and the ovules in plants, sperm and eggs in animals. These factors within a few years were found to be linked to the chromosomes that were discovered a little later to be separating in dividing cells as shown here in this late 19th century drawing of onion root tip cells. These Mendelian hereditary factors are what we now call genes. In the 1940s, Oswald Avery in Rockefeller University, New York, um, where I worked some years ago for nearly 10 years, showed that these uh, genes were made of deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. Now, the structure of DNA, which is shown here in uh, this um, scheme um, as a double helix, was established around 10 years later in London, by Rosalind Franklin, Ryan Gosling and Maurice Wilkins, um, who did the experiments, and in Cambridge by Francis Crick and Jim Watson. Crick and Watson famously argued that the double helix structure of DNA could explain heredity. Through the linear sequence of bases making up DNA and the pairing between complementing bases with adenine pairing with thiamine and cytosine with guanine, as you can see here in this scheme of a replicating or copying double helix. This double helix, you can consider it like a twisted ladder. The rungs of the ladder are made up of the links between these complementing bases. And when these links are split, two templates are formed 
which are used to make two new identical helices. And this explains how the DNA is copied during cell reproduction, accounting for heredity. It also explains Schrodinger's code script and the permanence of the gene between generations because DNA acts as a code script, which is precisely copied every time a cell divides. And so it's maintained in that state from generation to generation. And the sequence of bases encoding the genetic information is kept stable in the middle of that DNA polymer double helix. Crick went on to propose what is, uh, he called the central dogma, explaining how the DNA encodes the structure of proteins. Now, this central dogma describes how the sequence of bases making up a, a, a gene is copied from the DNA to uh, ribonucleic acid or RNA, shown here as mRNA or messenger RNA, because it acts as a messenger between the DNA located in the nucleus, where the chromosomes are, and the cytoplasm, where the proteins are mostly made. And the sequence of that messenger RNA determines the structure of proteins. And there's one gene for each protein. Now, these discoveries were made in the second half of the 20th century, and they laid the foundations for molecular biology. They are critical for understanding life. And central to this is the genetic code. Heredity is written in a four letter code made up of the four bases that I've described to you, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, with the information stored in a linear form. This way of storing information is the same as sentences in a book, the words I'm speaking to you now, or bytes in a computer. It, of course, means that the linear digital storage of information was invented by life probably over three billion years before the computer age. The nature and function of the, of the gene introduces the next two ideas that I want to talk about. They are life as chemistry and life as information. Now, the functioning of living organisms is based on chemical uh, activity and physical forces. This is an idea we now um, take for granted, um, but it was not always so. The origins of this idea can be traced back um, mostly to French chemists. There was initial work uh, by Lavoisier, who was the father of chemistry, although unfortunately lost his head in the um, uh, French Revolution. But it was Louis Pasteur, who carried out experiments on sugar beet fermentation in the north of France, which led to the concept that life can be thought of as chemistry. How does chemical activity and physical forces bring about life? Here is Louis Pasteur, um, grandly working in his laboratory, um, by this time in Paris. He, at the time when he did his uh, work on um, sugar beet in the north of France, he was uh, studying a problem of fermentation to make alcohol. And he did this at the request of industrialists because the fermentations that these industrialists um, undertook of, of, of sugar beet to make alcohol sometimes failed and made acid instead. And what Pasteur did is he demonstrated that successful production um, of alcohol required the activity of a single-celled living organism, yeast. He proposed that the yeast cell produced substances that made alcohol from the sugar, derived from the sugar beet, and if yeast was not there, but bacteria instead, which he looked at under his microscope, then the fermentation made um, acid. By the way, I'm very fond of yeast because I've worked on it for most of my life. And you're going to meet Lee Hartwell, who also worked on yeast. And indeed, I started working on that organism largely from reading his papers when I was a graduate student. Now, Pasteur concluded more generally that fermentation was a physiological act which yielded products for the cell. And he generalized that by saying 
Therefore, chemical reactions are an expression of the life of the cell. Now, I'm going to stand up and try and get the lights working in this room again. So do excuse me for one moment. I should explain it's half past eight in the morning and the lights go off rather irritatingly automatically. Um, Louis Pasteur concluding that life is chemistry, but it's a very elaborate and special chemistry and it's based on carbon polymers. And I want to talk about this. Now we've already met um, carbon poly polymers that make up the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. But now I want to consider the carbon polymers that make up proteins. The substances from uh, yeast that Pasteur postulated made the alcohol are proteins that act as enzymes, which catalyze chemical reactions. Now, proteins are um, polymers of amino acids, mainly based um, on uh, carbon and nitrogen, with the carbon atoms forming both the backbone to the polymer and also the links to the side chains of the amino acids. In this slide here, you'll see the structure of such a polymer shown here, with the backbone um, with nitrogen and carbon, and then these um, side um, uh, chains there, um, uh, uh, indicated by the letters R. And these side chains, uh, these different amino acid side chains, are chemically different. Some of them are positively charged, some negatively, some repel water, some are big, some are small. Examples are shown um, here um, of the different sorts of the 20 amino acids that make up um, proteins. And the result of all of this is a wide variety, in fact, a gigantic variety of chemistry that can produce elaborate structures which carry out many and varied chemical reactions. This contrasts really with DNA, which is stable, not chemically diverse, and in fact is chemically rather dull. In contrast, the chains of amino acids making up protein polymers fold up in many different ways. They make complex molecular structures. Um, I show here um, a protein chain um, of, uh, of many different amino acids and a three-dimensional molecular structure derived from that one-dimensional chain. And these varied structures, combined with the varied chemistries of the different amino acids, accounts for the wide diversity of chemical reactions that enzymes can carry out. Enzymes and other proteins act as chemical machines. These machines produce the huge range of chemicals required for living organisms to function. They make new molecules, they break molecules down, they recycle them. They generate large molecular assemblies which synthesize polymers of nucleic acid, protein, lipid, and carbohydrate. And they also, these machines, do physical work. They make motors which carry cargoes around the cell on protein-based trackways. They act in hybrid ways combining chemistry and physics, capturing energy from sunlight, or breaking down sugars to produce energy-rich chemicals that drive the activities that are carried out in cells. All this activity means there are thousands of chemical reactions being carried out simultaneously and close to each other in living cells all the time at the same time. A small uh, uh, selection of these are shown as dots in this map of what we call the central metabolism of cells, the chemistry of life. Because these uh, reactions require different chemical conditions, they have to be somewhat separated from each other. This is achieved by compartmentation, brought about by the surfaces and folds of the enzymes, by complexes of several enzymes acting together, and by membrane-bounded organelles, visible in this cell here, which I showed you a little earlier, which is schematized here to show the different cellular compartments that are found in cells. And the way I'd like you to think about these is that these compartments represent different chemical microenvironments. 
which allow the hugely elaborate chemistry of life to take place in slightly different locations within the cell. But for all of this to work, this chemistry has to work together as a whole. It has to be organized together. And that requires communication between these different chemical microenvironments and compartments. Now, communication is the transfer of information. And that leads to the next idea I want to talk about, life as information, where I'm going to touch on complex systems, control, and even purpose. And this is something, of course, our host has also uh, written about. Life is a complex system. That was first argued, at least the first argument I can find that expressed it reasonably well by the philosopher Immanuel Kant at the turn um, of, the, uh, uh, of the 1800s. Um, the operations of the complex systems of life are based on the management of information. And I'm gonna give you two examples to illustrate this. For the first example, I'm going to return to the structure of DNA. You saw this slide a little earlier. Now, the structure of DNA, the double helix, it's iconic, it's beautiful. We often see it in sculptures outside research institutes, sometimes um, perhaps too often. But it's not the structure itself which is so beautiful. The real beauty lies in the fact that it only makes sense, certainly biological sense, when it is recognized to be, as I've already mentioned to you, that what it really is, is a digital information storage device. One that is written in the linear script of four letters that we've already discussed. This means the linear polymer of DNA is ideal for storing information with the encoding letter bases turned inside the helix protected or at least partially protected from chemical change. Now, even better, this information stable in the middle of that uh, double helix can be turned into chemical action that can do work through the chemical activities of proteins. And for me, this is one of the most wonderful characteristics of life, all based on carbon-based polymers. The ability to encode information in one-dimensional linear structures and to carry out chemical and physical work in three dimensional structures. Second example of information in life I want to tell you about is all centered around regulation. That is making the complex systems in living things act as a whole to apparently act with purpose. Now, a, a familiar example of regulation which helps me introduce this topic is found in man-made machines. This example is the governor developed by James Watt to regulate steam engines. Um, I discovered this in a, a, a boat, in, in a 19th century boat, actually, when I was on holiday in New Zealand, and I had to take a photograph of it. Now, as the engine goes faster, these balls swing out, and they lift that valve there, shutting off the steam. And when uh, the uh, um, engine goes slower, they swing in and switch on the steam. And this leads to homeostasis, maintaining a constant speed of the steam engine. I had to go back to the 19th century for this example because I find I understand machines in the 19th century and increasingly don't as we go through the 20th and 21st um, uh, century. Now this governor is a good example of what we call a negative feedback loop, shown here in the context of a metabolic pathway in a cell. Um, the top A, B to C there um, is an example of a negative feedback loop. The metabolic pathway goes from A to B to C. These are different uh, metabolites catalyzed by uh, different enzymes, for example. And as C builds up, it inhibits A to B and shuts off, therefore, the synthesis of C. And that leads to homeostasis, a constant level, in um, the amount of C, the level of C in the cell. Negative feedback in cells was first um, well and convincingly demonstrated by the great French geneticist Francois Jacob and Jacques Monod studying gene regulation of sugar metabolism in bacteria. And I was brought up on this as an undergraduate many years ago. Other control modules 
lead to positive feedback at the bottom part of this slide. Um, and in this case, as C builds up, it doesn't inhibit A to B, but accelerates A to B. So you make more C. A consequence of this is, is that the module acts as an irreversible switch. Many such feedbacks and control modules operate in cells. They maintain homeostasis, generate switches, timers, toggles, oscillators, translating chemistry into informational modules. These can be linked together to generate even more elaborate routines of informational management and processing. A metaphor for all of this is an electronic circuit of linked um, uh, uh, modules. Now, although this metaphor is useful, and this is, of course, a control circuit, um, probably from a, a radio, although this metaphor is useful, a better metaphor for living systems is what has been called, rather than hardware, wetware. Because the components in wetware can be relinked through solution chemistry, increasing the versatility of the control modules. Now, the management of life's chemistry by information allows the behavior of a, a complex system to act as a whole with an apparent overall purpose, such as reproducing a cell or making a butterfly or maintaining ourselves. Now, for centuries, the generation of purposeful behaviors, such as the ones I've just described, was thought to require a designer, a divine creator. It took evolution by natural selection to change this and that is my final idea. This is a beautiful idea. It's mainly due uh, to Charles Darwin and has two parts. Life evolves over time. And secondly, a major mechanism for this evolution is natural um, selection. Now, that life evolves, in fact, was widely discussed um, in the century before Charles Darwin. For example, by Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and Charles' own grandfather, shown here, Erasmus Darwin. Erasmus was a colourful character, a scientist, a doctor, a poet. All his research was written in poems. I have several copies of the original edition um, in my home. He was also a Republican, um, refused to be George III's um, private physician a proponent of women's education and a great conversationalist, despite a terrible stammer. But for biologists, what he argued for was the evolution of life, suggesting simple formless mollusks, like a snail, the inside of a snail shell could evolve into complex animals. Now the evolution of life implies that there is a tree of life, that living things are related. If life only arose and survived once, as seems likely, given the conserved chemistry and coding found in all living organisms, then all life on Earth is related to each other. And this connection of life was captured in the only diagram in Darwin's Origin of Species, published in 1859, where he illustrated the first tree of life, shown here. He wasn't quite sure if it arose more than once however, if you look at the bottom of this diagram. He gathered evidence in favour of life evolving through natural selection during his trip round the world in the ship, the Beagle. Now, natural selection is a consequence of populations of species exhibiting variations caused by inheritable genetic changes. And these can be caused by mistakes made when DNA is copied, or if DNA is damaged by external causes such as radiation. If these variants influence characteristics that make these organisms more successful, better adapted, and so reproduce more, then that particular genetic variation will spread through the population. And over time, such genetic variations will accumulate and lead to changes in the population such that individuals of that new population would no longer be able to breed with the original population. This eventually can lead to a new species which is better adapted and is more successful in survival and reproduction. Darwin came to this view in part by studies 
of birds, studies of finches on the Galapagos Islands in um, the Pacific. Uh, here's some examples on the left there of some of the finches that are found there. Some of these have big uh, beaks that can break nuts, like at the top. Others, thin beaks, like the one at the bottom, that could more easily catch insects under the bark of trees. They became adapted to their lifestyle and their environment be, for, by being specialized better for what they had to do to succeed. Just like the different pliers, illustrated on the right, that are specialized to do different jobs. But the difference between the beaks and the pliers are, of course, is that pliers are intelligently designed by human beings for different specialized purposes, while the finch's beaks achieve specialized purposes by natural selection without a divine designer or creator. Now, for natural selection to take place, three things are needed. First is reproduction. The second is a heredity system. And the third is that that heredity system needs to exhibit variability upon which selection can work. And let me show how this can work based on the ideas that we've already met, the ideas of the cell and the gene. Imagine a single celled life form with a brown cell coat, the color of which is determined by a gene in its chromosomes. Imagine when the cell divides and copies its DNA, it makes a mistake. So the cell coat gene is altered and the cell now makes a red coat, as you see at the bottom right hand corner. Now also imagine that red coated cells survive better. Perhaps they don't taste um, good to a predator. As a consequence, the red cells replace the brown cells in the population and evolution by natural selection is taking place. This is a profoundly important idea in biology. So much so that the 20th century geneticist Hermann Muller used it to define what life is. He simply defined life as living things have properties which allow them to undergo natural selection to evolve. The three characteristics, in fact, which I've just described to you. Now, I'm going to consider this a little further when I finish my talk in, in, uh, in a moment. But before doing that, I want to say goodbye to Darwin as an old man with the final, frankly, monumental sentences from his Origins of Species. Beautiful sentence. Whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Note here how he was relating his work to the great physicist Isaac Newton, and also arguing that biology can have fundamental laws just like physics. To help thinking about defining life, I finally want to consider the difficult category of intermediate life forms, the viruses. And I hope this will help clarify how we should think about the nature of life. Viruses, and here's an example here, bacterial virus actually, are based, their genetic information, the genome is based either on DNA or RNA. They undergo evolution by natural selection, as we've seen with the variants in the COVID-19 coronavirus, and thus pass Muller's test, but can only reproduce when they are inside the cells of other host living organisms, like the virus inside our own cells. And they do so by hijacking the cell's molecular machinery to copy the virus's genome and to make more viruses. This means that a virus is completely dependent upon another living entity. You could perhaps also say that a virus is alive when it's inside a cell and is a lifeless chemical when outside a cell. But the question is, should we think viruses are truly alive? And in thinking about this, I think it's important to remember that other forms of life are also, to a greater or lesser extent, dependent upon other living beings, including ourselves. The many parasites that live on or inside the cells or bodies of animals, plants or fungi are examples of this. Although, of course, the extent of their dependencies are less than it is for a virus. 
There are certain amino acids that us humans cannot make, and we need to obtain them from other living organisms. Even free living microbes are dependent upon molecules um, made by other living organisms, or be it simple molecules such as glucose and ammonia. Plants are rather more independent living organisms using the energy of the sun to make biomolecules from simple chemicals, including carbon polymers described from, uh, derived from atmospheric carbon dioxide. But even plants rely on bacteria found in their roots that capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, independent organisms are the cyanobacteria, single-celled microbes that capture both carbon and nitrogen from the atmosphere and energy from the sun. Now, I mention all of this to stress that there's a graded spectrum of living organisms from the viruses through to plants with a wide range in between. And all these different life forms have varied dependencies on other life forms. In the case of the virus, that dependency is very strong. In other living organisms, the dependency is weak. But I argue all of these different life forms, including viruses, are alive because uh, I follow Muller's definition because they all evolve by natural selection. But it means one more thing. It means that life on Earth is fundamentally connected, both through being related as a result of evolution and also through these deep relationships and deep dependencies. Now, I began this talk by saying that by considering some of the important ideas of biology, we would establish some we could try and establish, I should say, principles to understand what life is. And let me now summarize where I think we've got to. Although I have to warn you, it does not lead to a neat dictionary-like definition of life. So this is the, what I'd like you to think about when you leave here. Living things are independent physical entities separated from their environment, but are in communication with their environment. Um, they are physical entities and therefore um, uh, that distinguishes them from computer games and so on, which are not independent bounded physical um, uh, ent entities. The fact that they're separated allows them from the environment, allows them to generate order and organization. The basic unit of life, at least on earth, is the cell and multicellular organisms are aggregates of cells. The second set of principles, the central principle for defining life, I will argue, is that developed by Muller. Life forms are entities that can undergo evolution by natural selection, and by doing so, they gain a, a, a purpose, uh, entities that can build, maintain, and reproduce themselves. And living things can evolve because they have the following attributes. They grow, they reproduce, they have a hereditary system, and that system exhibits variability. Thirdly, living things are chemical, physical, and informational machines. They construct their own metabolism, which is used to build and maintain themselves to grow and to reproduce. So you can see these principles are all interconnected. And finally, at least on Earth, life is based on carbon polymer chemistry. These polymers produce nucleic acid, uh, linear information storage devices, and protein-based chemical and physical machines. Integration of all these functions requires the management of information. Inputs are gathered from within and outside the cell, are processed, stored, and used to instruct cells and organisms to maintain themselves, to grow, and to reproduce. Living things on Earth are related by common descent are closely interconnected and dependent upon other living things. Now, should we ever in encounter life elsewhere in the universe, I suspect it will be based on rather similar fundamental principles. The details, of course, particularly of the chemistry, may be different. It may not be even based on carbon. However, in my view, for it to readily serve the need of long-term information storage, I think it's likely the chemistry will also be based on um, polymers, which are uh, the good way to store uh, informational, um, uh, linear digital information.
These life forms will need energy sources to power the processes of life, which could come from the nuclear reactions within stars, um, which we receive uh, as light and heat, or from geothermal energy within planets. But let's return to our planet, the only corner of the universe where we know for certain life exists. The life that we are part of here on Earth is extraordinary, as I said at the very beginning. It constantly surprises us. But in spite of its bewildering diversity, scientists are making sense of it. And that understanding makes a fundamental contribution to our culture and to our civilization. Our growing understanding of what life is has great potential to improve the lot of humankind. But in my view, this knowledge goes even further. Biology shows us that all the living organisms we know of are related and are closely interacting. We are bound by a deep connectedness to all other life, to the infecting bacteria, the fermenting yeast, the pea plants, the flitting yellow butterflies, all of which have accompanied us during this talk. Now, together, all the species of the biosphere on this planet are life's great survivors, the latest descendants of a single, immeasurably vast family lineage, lineage that stretches back through an unbroken chain of cell divisions into the far reaches of deep time. Now, as far as we know, we are the only life forms who can see this deep connectivity and reflect on what it means. That, in my view, gives us, us human beings, a special responsibility for life on this planet, made up as it is by our relatives, some close, some more distant. We need to care about it. We need to care for it. And to do that, we need to understand it. And that's why I've given this talk and that's why I've written this book, which I dedicated to my grandchildren, whose task it is to ensure that we do care for it in the coming generations. Thank you very much um, for listening to me. Um, I've very much enjoyed giving you this talk and I hope you have too. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, if you were in an auditorium, we'd be giving a round of applause at this stage, but uh, in, in this uh, virtual Zoom age, we can't do that. Uh, now, as promised, there's a short period of uh, question and answer. Uh, there's far too many questions, as you might imagine, for you to possibly answer. And so I've uh, been considering how best to put them to you. And uh, there's a, a very good question that follows on from really the last point you made, which is that life as we know it is based on these linear polymers. And the question is, how did they come to arise in the first place? Because uh, there are some meteorites called carbonaceous chondrites that have mm. organic material in them. And it's all gunky, tangled mess. And you get the same thing as with kerogen in ancient rocks. Uh, these delicate linear molecules, uh, it, it would seem like um, uh, a miracle for them to come into existence. I'm, I'm using that metaphorically. So what do you think? How did it come to exist in the first place? This, well, this you know, this is, this is a very good question. It's very difficult to answer. I'm putting up the white flag at the beginning. I don't know. I do know um, what um, scientists who think most deeply about this are thinking at the present time, which is that the origin of life, which is really what you're asking about, probably should best be thought about in terms of a life um, form that is dependent upon RNA as the hereditary material, because RNA has some greater chemical diversity. Um, it can um, fold up in, in more complex ways than DNA, and it and occasionally does have catalytic activity, so it can do chemistry. And so what this means is in a single molecule, you can have both storage of information and also some chemistry that can drive um, the properties of life, including maybe the uh, replication of that um, RNA. Then you could imagine that some RNA forms are found in, uh, and this is another speculation, maybe in geothermal vents in little uh, perhaps holes 
where which would um, uh, 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 um, take the form of eventually they would become cells in the, a later form, but you would allow concentration of chemicals and so on and things to work. And then somehow out of this, maybe out of lipids that form spontaneously um, spheres, you could get life. This is the sort of thing they talk about, but you know, miracle is almost the right word to describe it. And it happened, Paul, remarkably quickly. Um, the the uh, the Earth was formed maybe initially four and a half billion years ago, took a few hundred million years uh, to cool down, and yet the first fossils are only 3.5 billion years ago, so only a few hundred million years if it were to have evolved on this planet and didn't, as some suggest, come on a comet or something from somewhere else, um, a meteorite you, you, you mentioned. And really, that's rather short for me to feel comfortable about it, especially given that multicellular complex organisms didn't arise until 600 million years ago. So it took about 3 billion years to go from a first single-celled life to multicellular life, yet, yes, a few hundred million years to go from um, uh, chemicals to life. So this is Completely mysterious. There's no question about it, and it's the most difficult question. I hope you're going to ask me this evening. Uh, well, uh, I, I, the, the following, I'm sure, is unanswerable because we've had a lot of questions about definitions of life, and that could be a very long conversation. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm combining some together here. So, could life be based uh, on uh, silicon instead of carbon? Mm. Might, might it uh, not use polymers, but something more like a floppy disk of two dimensions, uh, or uh, what would happen in the future if we fuse biological and non-biological machines? Uh, would we call those living? And all of these things uh, make a great dinner time conversation, but I doubt very much if we'd have yes now answers to them. <laughs> well, what I will say is, um, and I deliberately uh, left, um, I stated, you know, life could be based on other chemistries. Silicon is the one that is most often talked about. It's the um, it commonly appears in science fiction novels, for example, who quite often talk about silicon. It's not so good as carbon, at least under conditions we have in planet Earth for various reasons. But there's no, if we take the definition of life of, as, uh, as uh, uh, entities that can evolve by natural selection and have these other properties, it doesn't have to be carbon based, although certainly in the conditions we have here, it makes sense. But we have to realize carbon is not uh, uh, anywhere near as common as silicon. It's about a, a tenth of the level. So maybe there's silicon life out there somewhere, maybe circling Saturn, who knows? I think we'd agree that uh, what we really need is a second sample of life, and then that would make uh, defining life very much simpler. And doesn't that make the Mars experiment so amazingly fascinating? You know, what would be great is to discover another life form on Mars. I, I, I hope they can do it in the next 10 years so I can see it. Right, I think we all do. Um, at this point, I'm going to bring in our panelists and we can continue this discussion. I will just say to the audience, keep on sending in your questions. I'm scrambling to uh, keep up with them because there will be further discussion uh, during the panel and, and after the panel. But uh, uh, be, before we do that, I have to introduce our four distinguished panelists. They all work at ASU uh, and it's a great pleasure to introduce them. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take first Lee Hartwell. So he shared the <clears throat> 2001 Nobel Prize with Paul Nurse. Uh, Lee has appointments now in the schools of education, mm -hmm. biomechanical engineering and sustainability, and he leads the Honeybee Clinical Trials Program. He was previously president and director of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Athena Aktipis in the Department of Psychology. Athena's co-director of the Human Generosity Project and a member of the Arizona Evolution, uh, Cancer Evolution Center. She also hosts the Science Podcast you may have heard about called Zombified and is author of The Cheating Cell, How Evolution Helps Us Understand and Treat Cancer. Then we have Josh Labai, Executive Director of the Biodesign Institute. And if you work at ASU, you've done one of those uh, very handy COVID saliva tests, well, you have Josh to thank. Uh, he's also chair of the NCI's Early Detection Research Network Steering Committee and recent president of the US Human Proteome Organization. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Sarah Walker, uh, 
she's a physicist and astrobiologist in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and Deputy Director of the Beyond Center and also Associate Director of ASU Santa Fe's Institute's Center for Biosocial Complex Systems. That's a bit of a mouthful. Anyway, Sarah wrestles with the question, what is life as well? And also thinks about how we go about finding it beyond Earth. So that's our distinguished panel. Uh, and um, I would like to start by asking the panelists in the order I introduced them, to just give us a two or three minute summary of how uh, they see the problem of what is life, <clears throat> or if they have something specific uh, to comment on from the lecture, that would be fine. And Paul can stay with us for a while uh, to uh, maybe respond to some of those comments. So Lee, could I start with you? Sure. Um, hi, Paul, and uh, thank you very much for that wonderful uh, overview of uh, biology and life as we know it. Uh, I think your book will be uh, extremely well received and popular uh, for all of us. Um, I, I'm particularly uh, interested uh, in education at this time in my life. And uh, what I really, I think, took away from your lecture was um, something that I, I think we've been um, uh, remiss in as biologists uh, in educating, uh, and that is sort of trying to uh, formulate and articulate what the fundamentals of biology are. I think you've done a wonderful job of that and that um, we could benefit by um, organizing our uh, education of biology around a set of principles like that rather than the uh, various ways we try to do it now. I, could I just respond to that, actually, yes. Paul? Uh, yeah. Yes, I've been muted myself, so uh, yes, please go ahead. First of all, it's so nice to see Lee. I haven't seen him in the flesh for quite some time, so it's mm. great to see you, Lee. I think he's completely right. I think what we do with our poor students and um, at school and at universities is overwhelm them with lots and lots of facts. And we don't see how we can pull it together to get principles. And I, I, we're going to drive the poor kids away if, we, if these textbooks get bigger and bigger and bigger. We've got to focus on principles in exactly the way Lee said. So I really support everything you say. So, Athena, uh, perhaps we could hear from you. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, Paul, for your, your talk. And I've really been enjoying your book as well. Um, so I love the idea of thinking about life as, you know, those things that can be subject to evolution by natural selection. I think it's a very elegant um, way of kind of approaching things. Um, one of the things that I, I, I kind of got a little bit stuck on or wondered about though, is this issue of boundaries, right? Because yes, you know, there are these benefits, right? To compartmentalizing because you can basically have like local information kind of being processed and it lets you um, kind of scale up in a way that, um, that lets you process information in more complex ways. That's sort of how I think about it. But if we look at the entities that are subject to natural selection, not all of them have clear boundaries around them, right? I mean, populations of bacteria often are selected as populations of bacteria, sometimes in a very distributed state in an organism because of how they're affecting that organism. And I mean, indeed, even just the idea that all of what is life is happening within the boundaries, that doesn't really fit with a lot of what we know about how organisms can hijack and manipulate each other and almost have this sort of, you know, what Dawkins called the extended phenotype, where part of, you know, what makes them evolutionarily viable is the way that they are affecting the physical environment, the social environment, even changing gene expression in other organisms. So I... I have sort of questions around using boundaries as part of how we're defining life. And I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's an important um, point um, you make, Athena. Uh, 
um, I suppose um, my response would be that to get a core understanding of life, it is useful to think of compartments because that gives you a certain clarity. But then, as is often the case in natural phenomena, <laughs> Um, it allows you to assimilate those which are a little bit more on the grey side. I mean, we have the same problem with viruses, which I tried uh, to deal with. And you are right, there is the extended phenotype. And you're right, the social organisation. So that the where, uh, uh, well, at least for me, and it is a bit of a contentious issue, of course, but where the unit of selection is, which is the point you're making, is not entirely clear. However, without understanding it first as a bounded entity, it's difficult to actually get your head around the more extended one. So my excuse to you, because um, I do think you're right, my excuse is let's start with the, uh, the clarity of the bounded entity um, and then we can discuss the extended phenotype. The other reason I um, stress the bounded entity is really um, forgive me, Paul, to get the physicists off my back, okay, which keep going on about the second law of thermodynamics all the time. And this is my way of escaping it by saying, uh, yes, of course, the second law of thermodynamic works, but it's on the other side of the fence, so we don't have to worry about it. So, uh, well, well put. Uh, Josh, <laughs> what does life mean to you? Well, so um, I'm a physician by training, so of course, um, I have my own kind of uh, biases there. I probably would land in the camp where I'm not sure I would include myself viruses in life. I think that they, to me, they're pieces of paper that say copy me on them. And then things that are living, pick them up and make copies of them. I do have a couple questions though. I, I, I I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the importance of water. Because it seems to me like water is a critical, you even alluded to it when you mentioned the idea of a sort of wet circuits as opposed to mm. the dry ones. And it seems to me like a critical element of what makes life life is is bounding water to some extent. And then another question I would have is managing one's energy, because a key element to me of life is that um, all living things I can think of in one way or another manage energy flow. Um, sometimes they make energy, not always, uh, but they always sort of manage it. So I'm just sort of wondering what your thoughts are on those two ideas. Well, um, both water and energy are um are very important and I suspect will be universal, certainly energy will be. Um, water I imagine could be, but just maybe my imagination isn't quite wide enough. Um, the wetware, I wish I'd invented it and it was invented, I think it's a great term, by Dennis Bray actually, who's a sort of um, theoretical biologist, um, wrote a, 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 a nice book on wetware because um, of this notion that you can reconnect the hardware. I, I completely, um, I didn't steal it, but I certainly um, took it from him. Water is critical. It's where the chemistry can happen. It's got all the properties you need to get all the variety of chemistries that, that happen. And it's crucial to life as we know it for sure. And uh, I can't really imagine another solvent because it has to be solvent based in some way. And I can't imagine another solvent which would do that job. So um, um, I'm with you. I think it's water. I quite like talking more about the principle of the polymer because of the notion of the polymer as a storage device and of active chemistry, I think, takes us into different and new places. And energy is really important. One thing I will say is, though, we shouldn't think that life as we know it is highly efficient because it isn't. And in fact, it's rather wasteful of energy. We tend to always think it's evolved to this perfection. It's only evolved to a point where it's probably as good or as a little bit better than other life, not perfection. And it may be that we'll be able to artificially evolve into something that is more um, efficient energetically. Uh, but the need for energy is crucial. I identified um, nuclear energy within the sun, light and heat and geothermal energy. And of course, many think that the origins of life might have occurred in, um, in, ge in geothermal times. And I love to read what physicists say about these sorts of things, because I think they, like Schrodinger uh, did, um, it, it gives us, you know, makes it think about it in a different way. And I should say one of my daughters is a professor of physics, so I've got to keep, I've got to keep polite about the physicists as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Great, good. Uh, well, uh, and then over to a physicist by training, uh, Sarah Walker. Uh, Sarah, uh, uh, what does life mean to you? And do you have any questions for Paul? Yeah, um, thanks so much, Paul, for the lovely lecture and, and engaging in discussion afterward. Um, I, I was going to raise sort of a similar set of points to Athena's because um, I was kind of interested in this idea of boundaries and how you were thinking about it. Um, but I'm going to uh, sort of introduce maybe sort of a slightly different way of thinking about it, which then goes back to the RNA world and just some questions about that, which I think, you know, for the reasons you articulated, we have to focus on the structures that we observe and understanding those before we can get to the deeper principles and sort of the unified perspectives. Um, but the thing that always struck me is that there are no real hard boundaries in living systems and really what we should be thinking about is say the entire lineage of information propagating across time and space as what we should be calling life. And if you think about it from that perspective, each structure we observe has a history and evolutionary process building it. Um, and so if you just focus on the structures without thinking about hi that history and sort of the informational prop like information being uh, part of that history. Um, it's very easy to say go back to looking at a bounded structure that has an evolutionary process like RNA and saying oh it could spontaneously form on early earth because you've ignored all the information content in RNA and how much evolutionary history must be built to build something as complicated as RNA. And so for me, I don't think that RNA could possibly be the first living material on earth because it's too complex and has too much history already built into those molecules. And some of the misnomers about that, I think, come from this idea of thinking that life is these fundamental units and that we need to look for the physical structure and not this sort of more general process that's happening. So I was just curious on your perspective on that, if you had thought about the RNA world in sort of a relationship to what you were talking about with the fundamental unit of the cell. Um, because uh, I, I guess it's sort of all these concepts seem separate, but you can turn them and look at them as, you know, you've partitioned it very nicely into information, chemistry, compartmentalization, but you could kind of merge those in some interesting ways and get a different perspective. Um, well, for sure. Hopefully but, that's clear. <laughs> yeah, no, Sarah, it is. And, um, uh, uh, and it's um, very insightful. Uh, I, I should say one reason I wanted to talk about compartmentation, which is a bit orthogonal to what you're saying, which I'll, I'll come back to, is because uh, when, we're, when we're taught cell biology, as biologists, we just uh, look at the cell as if it's a lot of sort of little, um, little compartments, and that's all we think about. And what I was trying to introduce into the discussion is the notion, which is really rather related to what you're saying, is that it's highly dynamic, that what we're looking at is chemical microenvironments which allow certain things to happen in different places but also when i'm talking about the issue of um of information it's all highly interconnected so i i do think i was touching in the same areas as as you were you were doing um but i i really object to the teaching of um, biology as just these are structural things and we think of them as structures because they're actually reflecting a variety of chemistry they're reflecting dynamic things which is in the same direction as i think that you that you are uh, talking about what is so interesting about this discussion in fact discussion with all of you is that you can you can get certain principles the principles give you a certain clarity but it then allows you to absorb, if I might say, a certain vagueness on the edges of the principles, um, which makes it even richer. And I think quite a lot of what you said, but if we don't hang on to some sort of uh, cause, we will get lost into, uh, in, um, uh, our, without having any firmness to hang on to. So uh, it's like when you're walking, you know, on the, in, I'm trying to think of a metaphor, going through a swamp, you know, if you don't have something a bit firm to navigate the swamp, you just sink into it. I'm not sure it's a great metaphor, but anyway, I was, I was trying to have a go of it. I wanted to have something solid for my feet, and then you can explore the swamp. Yeah, that's not so bad. I'm not suggesting oh. your thinking is swampy, by the way. I'm only <laughs> saying it's a, a bit less yeah, easy to navigate. Yeah. Well, uh, Sarah, Sarah and I have been much inspired by your vision of life as, uh, as information, the information playing such a critical role. Uh, and uh, I, we've had 39 questions, so it's been very difficult for me. But one of these questions relates to that whole issue about information. You've explained very well how uh, 
uh, genetic information on uh, polymers can be replicated and so on. But you've also explained that uh, information uh, permeates biology in many other ways, signaling molecules and physical forces between cells and so on. So the question uh, is, um, what can you tell us about uh, the uh, replication of epigenetic information? And epigenetics refers to all of the information in life that is not part of the genes. Well, I think epigenetics, which is sort of beyond the gene, um, not uh, uh, genetics. Um, actually, you know, biologists argue a lot about what epigenetics means, and we'll end up having a, a long argument if we try and um, define it, because it really it does mean different things to different people. But most, most now think of, it, of uh, epigenetics is to do with um, the, the uh, structure of, uh, of, of, of chromatin, chromosomes, beyond the DNA, um, with proteins that are, are attached to DNA that can change the expression of the DNA and therefore um, what um, proteins are made and which is very stable or can be very stable and maybe even inherited. Um, it attracted attention because for some it, it challenged uh, Mendelism, I mean Mendelian genetics and so on. I don't think that is actually holds much water to be quite honest, but it's an extra level of complexity, a little bit like the, walking through the marsh again. You, once you've understood the gene, you can understand epigenetics as, as, a, as a variation upon gene um, activity. And uh, it, it's, it's clearly very important. And there's many um, um, excellent work because you have stable um, cells take on stable identities because of epigenetic signals. And there's a great deal to be um, uh, to be learnt there. I don't see it as a challenge to genetics, which some people do. I see it as an extra qualifier of understanding how genetics and, for that matter, cells work. Yeah, sorry, uh, we probably have time for just one more of the audience question before you need to go, Paul. Um, and uh, it's uh, from a, a viewer, a listener who uh, wonders uh, why we are fixated about life on Earth starting on Earth. Couldn't it have started somewhere else and come here? Yes, this is uh, panspermia, this idea. Um, Fred Hoyle was a, a big supporter of it. Um, so it was Francis Crick, of course. And so it was Francis <laughs> Crick. And I'm sitting in the Francis Crick Institute here this evening, as it's evening here. And um, I always think that this was a bit of a cop-out, to be honest, because um, uh, it means... Uh, that uh, that we don't have to think about how it evolved on Earth because it, it came about somewhere else and then was dumped here. Um, but we still have the problem as to where it came from and how it, it evolved there. So it solves the problem that I mentioned about 15 minutes ago as to why, how life could have evolved to produce cells in a few hundred million years, um, because um, it didn't evolve in a few hundred million years. It arrived, um, it arrived on a meteorite or or, or some such thing. However, um, probably it had to have arisen in this solar system unless it um, was very hardy, I would say, and uh, uh, frankly. And so uh, I'm not sure how much we gain from it, to be quite honest. Thank you. Um, uh, we, we might just sneak in uh, one last question because it could be a yes, no answer. Um, yeah, that, uh, and it's something that uh, Sarah and I think about a lot. So I'm, uh, I'm abusing my uh, uh, position as host. But do you think uh, that we fully understand life in terms of, of the known laws of physics? Or do we, like Schrodinger conjectured, should we entertain the idea of a new kind of physical law prevailing? Or is that beyond the pale for you? Well, Schrodinger did, uh, towards the end of his lovely little book, get close to uh, suggesting that we had to move outside um, the normal laws of physics. Now, my view is, um, we don't have to imagine anything that is, cannot be understood in terms of physics and chemistry, but I think that the, um, the complexity of life can take us to a, a, a different place. Um, and life is enormously complex uh, and we shouldn't underestimate how complex it is. And as an ordered entity, taking in all the things that we've said about whether entity and bounded entity is right. 
let's move that aside. It is very, very complex. Now, what I ac actually think about it is that it's not special physics, sorry, it's not physics that is outside the understanding of physics, but it is an extra complexity on top of what we normally think about. And I sometimes speculate when I've had too much to drink that um, just like physics underwent this extraordinary transition, um, first of all with relativity in 1905 and then in the 1920s um, with quantum mechanics, so it got completely sort of abstract and almost incomprehensible. And I should say, I mentioned my daughter, She her experiments are at the Large Hadron Collider. And oh. what was immensely reassuring is to learn that she didn't understand it either. Um, it, in an intuitive fashion, it's simply, uh, you can understand it in terms of the equations, but trying to get it inside your head is a completely different matter. I wonder whether biology, because of its complexity, will take us into a non-intuitive world which is not actually so easily understandable, in, but is understandable, um, which might be uh, similar to Schrodinger's sort of um, more mystical um, uh, uh, personification of that. So I, I don't know if that answers your, your uh, question. Well, it does. But... It does. Thank you very well. Um, and, and we don't like to detain you because I know you have another appointment. Um, and, but I did want to make sure that you don't just suddenly pull the plug and disappear because I would like to... Thank you very much again. Uh, I want to encourage the audience and of course the panelists to stay with us because we still have another 15 minutes for discussion uh, and we can deal with some of the questions. But Paul, uh, we should let you go. Uh, and you've lived up to this glorious tradition of the Beyond Annual Lectures, uh, pushing the boundaries of understanding and tangling with these deep philosophical issues. And I appreciate it very much. And so uh, just remains, I think, for you to pull the plug at your end and uh, uh, well, let um, me just thank you, Paul. Actually, it's been, I very much enjoyed it. I very much enjoyed your books and what you've said about information. It was very good talking to your colleagues from the university and uh, very good to say, um, see Lee again. And Anne, who Lee may remember, wanted me to send you her best wishes. Anne is my wife, who I'm about to have dinner with, which is the reason I have to leave now. So do forgive me and enjoy the rest of the discussion. I very much enjoyed this myself. Bye bye. Uh, thank you, and a round of applause. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so now, uh, as I mentioned, we have about uh, maybe another 15 minutes. Uh, there's, we don't have to have a hard exit, but I don't think we want to go on for more than uh, another 20 minutes because uh, everybody's busy. Um, and uh, we, uh, we can just sort of open the microphones to uh, any of the panelists who uh, want to make follow-up comments or discuss with each other. So rather than, than me dealing with the questions, let me peruse the questions, but ask you uh, uh, to talk among yourselves at this stage whilst I see if uh, we can inject a new topic. Um, well, Paul, if I may, I think there might be disagreement on the panel about whether viruses are alive. That might be interesting to sort of uh, talk about a little bit. I'm curious, you know, Josh, to hear a little bit more about, you know, where you sort of draw the line between, you know, what is life and what isn't and why viruses don't qualify. Right. Well, I guess I, 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 I don't, they, they certainly, there are certainly elements of viruses that, uh, that do follow the rules of what life is. They do evolve, they do mutate, there is variation. Um, but I would say they, they, they don't really control their own energy. Uh, so that for me is one of the things, they don't really metabolize by themselves. Um, they rely excessively much on um, hosts to do what, what the need, needs to happen. More so than for example, an intracellular bacterium might. So, an intracellular bacterium does still manage its own energy a little bit, and it and it does rely on a host, but it does kind of keep control of some of that stuff. So, for me, they they're just one step beyond what I consider life. I think, like I said, I think to me they're like little pieces of paper, sometimes very sophisticated pieces of paper that that instruct somebody else to do their bidding for them. They they basically say, copy me. And sometimes they have very elaborate mechanisms to get people to copy themselves. As you're talking, Josh, it makes me think about memes, like. Okay. Yeah. You know, they say like, spread me, share me, retweet me. <laughs> right, 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 right. But is a meme really a program? Mm, no. I wouldn't say so. Hmm. It's a matter of sort of degree of how much hijacking is happening. And once it gets to be like 
too much using someone else's m machinery, then you're like, mm, no, that's not life. Yeah, I guess so. That for me, that's that's what I would say. Could I, I put it to all of you? Um, are we too fixated on life as a little blob of something, whether it's a virus or a cell or something else? Should we be thinking of the system as a whole? Should we? I, I sometimes like to say that the biosphere is the original world wide web. It's a web of uh, chemical and informational exchange of immense complexity, and it sort of all hangs together. Uh, should we think of it in more in this systemic way? And I know Sarah has uh, thoughts uh, uh, along those lines. Well, I'd also like to hear from Lee about uh, that idea, if possible. Well, um, Lee, okay. Lee, go ahead, and then uh, we'll take Sarah. Okay. Um, What's on my mind is uh, something that uh, Paul uh, left off with, which is um, Erwin Schrodinger's um, reference to uh, even more mysterious phenomena. And uh, in his book, he talks about the experience of uh, color. And he says, you know, if you ask a physicist what uh, yellow is, he will say it's electromagnetic wave radiation of a certain wavelength. But if you ask him what, 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 the, what it means to be yellow, he'll say, I don't know. We don't have any um, understanding of what yellow itself means. And um, one of the things that I, I'm interested in is um, where are the areas that we don't understand, but we don't know that is the future for our students rather than what we do know or almost know. And this area of sensory perception um, and learning, I think, are wonderfully mysterious areas for future exploration. Very good. Scientists are not very good themselves at, uh, at saying what they don't know. They always like to tell us what they do know. But much more interesting, as you point out, is what they don't know. So, so Sarah, is life uh, a planetary level phenomenon or is it a little blob that spreads across the planet? <laughs> um, I think on that one, I would err on the side of a planetary phenomena. Um, and I think I can relate a little bit about that perspective back to what Athena and Josh were discussing and also what Lee mentioned, um, which I think part of the whole debate on the defining life discussion um, steps into a lot of hot water, I guess, because we're not asking the right questions. Um, and I think the virus question is actually ill posed. And this is why people can't answer it because people want to take one side or the other. And it's not really, um, it's not framed properly because we don't actually know what the phenomena of life is that we're talking about. So of course, there's going to be cases that sometimes fit in and sometimes don't. Um, and so typically when people are attempting to define life, they try to exclude cases that they feel intuitively are not life and they wanna include the cases they feel intuitively are. And then they come up with some definition that might exclude cases they intended to include and, and vice versa. Um, and you get all these sort of problems associated with it. Um, and so, so this is one of the reasons I was saying that life is really this whole process. And what we wanna understand is sort of the underlying fundamental principles that explain all the features that we associate to life. And those might be rather abstract and deep um, and they probably are related to some of the open questions that, that Lee was talking about. Um, but when you adopt that perspective, the only natural boundary for talking about living processes is actually the planetary scale, which is one reason that I think if we're thinking about what life is, we can't just think about individual parts, just like a DNA molecule in a cell is not alive on its own. Um, necessarily, it might, might be a product of life um, because it requires evolution to produce it. Um, when we think of, uh, you know, sort of what are the natural boundaries of the process that started the original life on our planet, um, the natural boundary for that right now is the planetary scale. But it won't always be uh, the planetary scale that's a natural boundary if we get off Earth and we go on other other planets, right? And we're starting to do that now. So, um, so I have a much uh, sort of deeper and ab more abstract view of what life is, is that life is just the process where, where information starts to become the dominant physics, which involves new physics. And it's that process propagating out in space and time. And that's basically everything that that thing, that physics ex is involved in, it should be the phenomena we call life. Um, so that, so something I think came up in the questions, which wasn't raised in the panel, and, and maybe we could talk about a little bit, 
is a lot of our discussion so far has been focused on biological notions of life. Um, but there are artificial systems that we're creating that are also only the product of an evolutionary process, i.e. the universe had to go through biological evolution to make technology. Would you consider those alive or not? Um, or part of life? Do they require similar explanatory frameworks or are they something totally different? Yeah, if I can jump in, because I think like there's a way to sort of build on some of what we've been talking about and transition to talking about these technological things, which is that you know, in a lot of ways, like as life becomes more and more complex in the sense of, you know, many different cell types, more regulatory systems sort of, you know, inside the cells that make it possible for life to be more complex. Um, it also opens up all of these doors um, for sort of hijacking of those systems. And that, you know, that can be through things that are parasitic that are actually, you know, taking away from the fitness of the organism, but you can also have, you know, um, things that are beneficial that kind of are able to also sort of get into those regulatory systems and affect them. And so I think as the, you know, global planetary phenomenon of life becomes more complex, you have organisms that are larger and have just more um, complex information processing happening within them. There's all these little places where you can sort of, you know, get um, parasites that are either negative or positive. And I think that is a very similar thing to what we have been seeing really in the last decade with the rise of the internet is it's like, it's becoming so much more complex. There's all of these, you know, things where, you know, uh, there could be regulation or there isn't regulation and, you know, different entities can kind of jump in and um, benefit themselves sort of inside the system. So I think that, you know, thinking about, you know, complexity and how that opens the door for parasites, both positive and negative, is, is really an interesting way to kind of tie a lot of these things together. Uh, I, have, I have another question which would open a sort of new line of inquiry, unless anybody wants to respond immediately to what Athena just said. Uh, we have a, a few more minutes. Um, and uh, this concerns uh, a central theme of Paul's lecture, which is uh, life is, is information, networks of information, the whole web of information exchange, is a very powerful concept. Um, and it's very easy to talk about, oh, uh, genetic information gets propagated or um, in the brain, uh, neural information gets uh, processed and so on. Uh, and then we have this whole level of, of chemical signaling taking place. And it's easy to use this term, oh, these are, uh, this is, these are signals, these are bits of information, but just how well do we actually understand that in life? How, how, how well understood is this whole network of information exchange? Is, is it just we're finding convenient words, or do we actually understand the mechanisms uh, at a deep level? Would anybody like to take up that? Well, I'll, I'll start, but I'm sure others will, will have other things to add there. We, so certainly some elements of how these chemical exchanges occur and how this information is processed, we're increasingly understanding them. I think uh, to the extent that we now know enough about them to manipulate them. And I think when you can manipulate something, um, you must understand it at least at, at some degree of proficiency. That's not to say that there isn't a whole lot we don't understand. Uh, there, there, there clearly is a lot we don't understand. If we want well, to take, you know, the, the classic example, which is the development of the embryo unfolding according to an ex exquisitely precise uh, informational plan. So we've got informational molecules, whatever they are, coupling to chemical networks, turning genes on and off, well, the whole thing choreographed in a breathtaking way without any choreographer. Right. Without any uh, any nerve center, no mission control, uh, and uh, uh, when I say uh, as a physicist, life looks like magic. I can't think of a better example of the magical nature. Uh, is that just poverty of information, uh, of, of uh, imagination by me, or uh, are we hot on the trade of understanding all those steps? I, I think. Well, I think we, we to, to different degrees we do a lot. I mean, in, in the case of an organism like uh, C. elegans, we actually know what every cell will become. We know, we, we actually know the exact number of cells that that organism will become. And we know the entire plan by which it will follow that. Um, it turns out humans are not quite so precise in their embryology, but nonetheless, we do have a pretty good understanding of that as well. So, so we do understand a lot of the principles. 
um, maybe many of the details we still need to learn. And of course, I'm sure we'll discover that there are principles that we don't yet know about. Is this the future of biology? Are we going to, uh, in another 50 years, think of biologists as a bit like you think of electronic engineers? You know, there are all these modules. I mean, Paul has written about this. It's these informational modules and processes, and they're wired together chemically. And when things go wrong, like in cancer, you can maybe get in and rewire them and uh, change the patterns of information flow. Uh, will, will the whole language and conceptual framework of biology be more like that of electronics or computing uh, in a few decades? Paul, it seems... Go ahead. Oh, just it seems to me that one of the issues is that, you know, even though the information is sort of stored, you know, hereditarily in an, um, you know, a... a analog kind of way, you know, or in a, um, in more of a digital kind of way, right, with the, um, the way that the genetic sequences are very specifically either this or this, right. But once you start getting to the process of, you know, creating proteins, and you have gradients, and you have compartments, then it, um, it gets a lot more messy. And a lot of that messiness is where the action is happening. And so I think it's actually, it's hard to break it into just circuits, because because you have so many processes that are actually very sort of physically embodied, you know, in three-dimensional space that have to do with, you know, gradients and interactions and these very small scale things that might be happening with enzymes that only, you know, um, where maybe it's only one in 10,000 times that that happens, but that's critical for actually making right. the cell function the way it does. Right. So, so to me, that's like the, it, 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 where it gets messy is where it gets interesting. And that's where it's hard to like have the circuits. Right. And to expand on that, I think the messiest part, the part that we really have a hard time with is understanding thought. I think as much as we think we know about how genetics work and how organisms reproduce themselves, Understanding how a thought is made or how a memory is recorded, I think we're, we're really struggling with that. It's, uh, on, that on that score, I've, I've got a question actually for Paul, which is, um, uh, you know, the thing that is really impressive about cells is how complex they are. Um, each in multicellular organisms, proteins have many, many different forms and many, many different in interactions. And we have just almost no comprehension of the degree of complexity. Um, and and the, so the question is, is as you increase complexity, is that just more detail or do you encounter fundamentally new principles? That's an excellent question. And there's, there's a long tradition among physicists and, uh, and chemists uh, to look at um, uh, where you get to thresholds of complexity in which you suddenly get something like a phase transition occurs and uh, you get new states of organization appearing. Uh, so this was pioneered by Ilya Prigogine many decades ago. He called uh, some of these things dissipative structures because they were far from thermodynamic equilibrium, but a whole hierarchy of complexity. And, I, and it's very easy uh, over, over dinner, uh, the dinner time conversation, uh, to uh, make it sound plausible that, of course, we recognize a hierarchy of complexity. Josh was just talking about, you know, what is a thought? We get up to something as complex as the brain, and we see whole new phenomena and possibly even new principles emerging at each, each level of complexity. Uh, but the Beyond Center some years ago held a workshop uh, on whether complexity inevitably in, increases over time. The universe started out simple in the Big Bang. Uh, and now we have all this uh, wonderful life and uh, a, a sky full of galaxies and so forth. And uh, what about the far future? So is, complex, is there a sort of natural law of increasing complexity? Many, many scientists say there is, but we, we can't prove such a thing. We, um, there is no known fundamental principle that says complexity has to go on up and up and up. And uh, indeed, if you believe some of the more pessimistic scenarios for how the universe is going to end, uh, complexity will decline in the very far future. So we're, we're, we're left with a, a bit of a mystery that uh, uh, are we at peak complexity now? Uh, and how has that arisen? Uh, and I think these are all open questions, all excellent questions. Um, and questions that we don't have any further time to debate, I think, 
this afternoon because we've uh, we've used up our 40 minutes and more. Um, and so uh, what I would like to do uh, is, of course, uh, thank uh, e each of you panelists for playing the game and taking part in this. Uh, we're free to continue these conversations or even convene little meetings uh, to tackle some of these ideas. But our audience, I think, uh, uh, will be uh, wishing to uh, to say goodbye. And so I'm going to just uh, thank uh, for the audience, uh, our four panelists, Josh Labar, Sarah Walker, Athena Tippis, and Lee Hartwell. Uh, thanks also to uh, Jessica uh, for being a mission control there and uh, making sure that these things uh, uh, proceeded flawlessly. And I very much look forward to the 2022 Beyond Annual Lecture. So watch this space and thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Bye.